birthday yesterday. Glad to see everybody here. And we're going to start our worshiping God through music as we all stand and we're going to go tell it on the mountain. Thank you, Lord, that we just celebrated uh, your son's first coming, Lord, uh, the 
because of your son he came to live that perfect life here on earth it shows us how to live and he died father the death the perfect death that you required the perfect sacrifice the sin of the sacrifice that only you would be satisfied with to pay for our sins father and just simply by believing in this and accepting your son into our heart we can be saved and have eternal life father i pray today that if there is one in our congregation that has not yet received your Son is their Lord and Savior. This would be their day of salvation, Father. I pray that you would start right now tugging at their hearts, Father, tugging at them and uh, bringing them to you, Father, and showing them that you have nothing but love and grace and mercy to offer them and forgiveness, Father, of sins. We uh, lift up all the names that have been mentioned here this morning. There's many names. There's uh, 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 people that need healing. There's people that that needs your touch. There's caregivers here that need strength and patience. Uh, we pray for the doctors and nurses that may be involved with anybody here this morning, that you would uh, just equip them and uh, uh, give them the wisdom and knowledge they need, Father, to, uh, work, use, to be used by you to uh, help these people that are in need. We pray for all the missions and ministries of our church. We uh, lift up the hands-on ministry, Father, that we would uh, just ask you to bless that ministry very specially. We just need participation. There's so much out there that needs to be done, and we just need to show up, Father, and go out and do the work that Jesus did while he was on earth. Lord, well, we just love you, and we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for blessing this church uh, the way you have over the last couple of years, and we thank you for that perfect prayer that you taught your disciples to pray so many years ago. It goes like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I just feel led to say within my heart and all the people that have visited and the people that are members here, this is a very much praising church. This is a loving church. We love people as they come in and we praise and worship God. So let's continue to do that worship in song as we remain seated and sing away in a minute. Praise the Lord.
You know, we as preachers, we love to get up here and preach about stuff like the Great Commission, addiction, apologetics, baptism, communion, community, and all that's good. All that's real good. We also like to preach about courage, creation, discipleship, evangelism, family, relationships, forgiveness, freedom. I could go on and on. And all these things are very, very important. Don't get me wrong. We should preach about them. But the topic that God has laid on my heart today is something that's rarely preached from the pulpit. And forgive me for not being in the pulpit. I like to make this my pulpit. Um, I like to get down on ground level with everybody so I can uh, see you face to face and focus on you and what I'm doing. So I hope that's okay with everybody. But the topic that God laid on my heart today is rarely preached from the pulpit. And it should be preached a lot more because this topic is a subject of anticipation. Um, you kids out there, we got the kids with us? They're already gone. They're gone. They're gone. Okay. Well, all of you. Did, he, did Santa Claus ever come see any of you as a child <laughs> by chance? Do you, not, do you remember how weeks in advance you would be anticipating Christmas Day? That's all you could think about all day long was what you're going to get for Christmas. Do you remember that feeling? How about when you, uh, these times, when, you're, when you go on a vacation? A lot of you go on vacations throughout the year. Um, weeks ahead of that vacation, what do you think about? The vacation, oh, yeah. right? It's all you think about. All day long is the vacation. Maybe you're getting a new house, Ken and her, uh, Audrey. I know that was on your mind every day for a long time. Probably you too, Marcy. Was that new house? That's <laughs> <laughs> all you can think about. Just different things like that. Uh, a new car. Some of us got new cars here lately, and that's all we can think about is we glad when they get that new car ready for me to pick up. But do you know where I'm going yet with this topic? You sure you know where I'm going? Because this topic is talked about in the Bible 1,845 times. It's mentioned in the Bible. In the New Testament alone, it's mentioned 318 times. Jesus gave us a commandment some 50 times on this topic. We just celebrated Jesus' first coming. So what a more appropriate time to celebrate his second coming, to talk about his second coming. So that's what we're going to talk about today, is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now you understand why I'm saying this topic needs to be a topic of anticipation. But let me tell you about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It can happen any time. There's nothing stopping him from coming right now, this very second, to gather up his church. Now, I need to help you understand the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because this second coming has two parts. The first part is the rapture, and the second part is the revelation. Now, I'm a believer in pre-tribulation rapture. Um, there's three different views there. And when I say tribulation, what I'm talking about is a literal seven-year period of time called the tribulation. Uh, the last three years are called the great tribulation. This is a seven-year period of time where God's wrath will be unleashed on planet Earth. All the wrath of God will be hammered down on planet Earth. There will be 21 unique and distinct judgments placed on Earth to judge a Christ-rejecting world. Now, I believe that we as Christians, as Christ followers, let me reword that, will be raptured up pre-tribulation, right when the tribulation starts. Now, what starts the tribulation is the revealing of the Antichrist. He is a leader. He will be in charge of leading the whole world. 
There will be one leader in the world at this time, a one world government, a one world religion, and the Antichrist himself will be the president, so to speak, of the earth at this time, in charge of everything. That's what starts the time clock of the seven year tribulation. Now, there's different views concerning the tribulation. And, and what I said, there's two parts. There's the rapture. That's what we're going to talk about today is the rapture. There's also the revelation, which happens after the seven years are over. So I believe, I teach, and I preach pre-tribulation. So I preach that we get raptured up right when the tribulation starts. And Jesus comes back at, to let to uh, judge the world and us along with him and to set up his kingdom for a thousand years at the end of the seven years. That's called the revelation. But we're going to be talking about the rapture today. But there's other views in this. Now I said a while ago Jesus could come back at any time. Nothing is stopping him. Some people, some Christians now, believe that we will get raptured up mid-tribulation. They're called mid trib Christians, they believe at the three and a half year point, the church will get raptured up then. That we'll have to go through the first three and a half years. Some Christians believe that we will get raptured up post-tribulation. In other words, at the end of the seven years, we'll get raptured up, but at the same time, we come right back down to be on the earth with Jesus for a thousand years. Which makes no sense to me. That would have to happen in just a split minute. Like I said, let me get a sip. I teach and I preach pre-tribulation. This is why I do this. There's different reasons um, that I preach this. And the most talked about thing about Jesus coming back right now is that verse over in Matthew 24, 14 where it says that all the, the gospel has to be preached to every nation for him to come back. But if you look at that verse a little closer, that verse applies to the revelation. Let me read it to you. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. He says, then the end will come. At the beginning of the tribulation, if we get raptured up, that's not the end of man's rule over earth, the government of man over earth. Man will rule over earth another seven years. So that verse, if you put it in context with everything that's around it, applies to the revelation of the second coming, the end of the seven years. Because during the seven year period, there will be people that will get saved. There will be people that will get saved. There will be the 144,000 Jewish witnesses that God will seal and place on earth to witness uh, to the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. There will be the two witnesses that God will give all sorts of power to. They will, um, be, they will have power to uh, destroy their enemies by fire. They can shut the rain off whenever they want to. They can put uh, any plague or pestilence on earth anytime they want to, but their sole purpose for being here is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there will also be the angel in Revelation 14 that flies from one end of the earth to the other preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you look at that verse again, it makes sense that this verse applies to the end of the seven years because at the end of the seven years, the end will come. The gospel will be preached to the whole world during the seven year period, and the end will come. There will be people saved during the tribulation period. Most of them that get saved will be martyred for their faith because at some point in the tribulation, right in the last three and a half years, everybody will be forced uh, to take the mark of the beast if they want to buy, sell, and trade. In other words, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you will not be part of the working economy at that time. You will have to fend for yourself. But if you do take the mark of the beast, you sell, you sell your soul to the devil. There's no backing out. So the Christians at that time uh, will be hunted down and martyred for their faith. There will be some that will make it through as Christians, as Christ followers. 
and they will go into the thousand year millennium. So enough about that. I just wanted you to understand the reasons I believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Another reason is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. It said, and this is the main reason. Listen to this scripture. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, that verse clearly says God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. The wrath of God will happen during that seven years. Uh, if you're in my Wednesday night class, you understand what I'm talking about. Terrible, terrible times on planet Earth. Another reason is Matthew 24, 36. It says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, if we was to get raptured pre-tribulation, we could time the coming of Jesus Christ, couldn't we? It'd be at the three and a half year point. But it clearly says no one knows, not Jesus, not even the angels in heaven. Did you know Jesus has designed his second coming around a traditional Jewish wedding? Did y'all know that? Some of you might know that. Let me tell you how a, a traditional Jewish wedding at the time of Jesus would have went. Now keep in mind what I'm about to tell you and compare it to the second coming of Christ or the rapture of the church, uh, the, the events that happened in the rapture. Now listen to this. A traditional Jewish wedding would have went like this. As children, this couple probably would have been paired up by their parents and they would have um, went and lived their whole childhood knowing that one day they'd get married to each other. Okay? When they got the appropriate age, excuse me, the groom would come to the bride's house and talk with her father, uh, get official permission, present the engagement ring, and have uh, a time to work out all the plans for the wedding. Now, this represents the, the first coming, what we celebrated yesterday, of Jesus being born, his first coming. That part represents that. Now, the groom then would go back home to his father's house and he would build a room onto his father's house. Uh, there's no telling how long it would take to build this room because the thing about it is only when the father, the groom's father said, okay, the room is ready, you can now go back, can the groom go back and fetch his bride? When the groom gets permission from the father, remember what I said about that day or hour where no one knows, not the angels, but only the father knows when it's time to go back? Same with the Jewish wedding. Only the father knows when it's time for the groom to go back to fetch his bride. Now, the groom would go back when his father gave him permission. That's Jesus coming back again the second time to gather up his church would um, only then and only then would the uh, groom go back and fetch his bride and he would go back unannounced. And he may go back in the middle of the night and gather up his bride. But at that time, he would go gather up his bride. They would have the wedding ceremony. And then the groom would take the bride into the wedding chambers and they would be alone for seven days. Now you see how all that works perfect with the first coming of, second coming of Christ. The Father only knows. He gives permission for Jesus to come back and gather up his church. Jesus comes back and gathers us up. In Revelation 19, it talks about the wedding supper of the bride. They have the ceremony. Then it, Revelation uh, talks about the seven-year tribulation. The seven years represents the seven days in the wedding chamber. Uh, this seven year period, uh, Daniel calls it uh, the seven, 70th week. And uh, Isaiah is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the seven year period of literal hell on earth. Okay, let's get into our scripture. We're going to look at two different places today. We're going to look at Matthew 24, 30 and 31. I just want to give you a backdrop on what we're talking about today. We're talking about the first part of the second coming, that is the rapture of the church. It can happen any time now, any time. Nothing is stopping it. 
Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31. Now this is Jesus speaking himself. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all peoples on earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, one from one end of the heavens to the other. Now from that, let's move over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. Now, this is Paul talking about what Jesus just said. Verse 15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, I've got four or five points I want to go over today. The first one being Jesus could come back at any time. I've laid out my reasons for believing that. I've laid out my reasons for believing nothing is stopping him from coming back right now. All prophecies have been fulfilled. There's nothing stopping. He can come back at any time. This is why I keep telling you that this event needs to be a, an event of anticipation. We need to have this event on our mind all the time. I personally don't think about it as much as I should. Here lately I've thought a lot about it because the Lord laid it on my heart to preach about it. But typically that's not something I would think about each and every day. But I need to be thinking about it because if I want to be on fire for the Lord, if you want to be on fire for the Lord, we have to live each and every day as if we believe He's coming back to get us that day. We don't want to be caught with Him coming back with unforgiveness in our heart. We don't want to be caught with Him coming back with laziness. And I can go on and on, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. The second point I want to bring up is only true Christ followers will be raptured. Only true Christ followers will be raptured. What I mean there is only the people who have not or who have lived a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ each and every day of their lives. Only those who have surrendered their whole self to Jesus Christ. Only those who have surrendered each and every avenue of their life to Jesus Christ. Their marriage, their finances, their relationships, their children, their home, their job. Only those who have surrendered everything to Jesus Christ. Now keep in mind, salvation is a progress in work. We're none of us is perfect. We have to work each and every day to do what we think is right. We have to work each and every day to live within the will of Jesus Christ. As long as we're doing that, Jesus, it, we're in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and Jesus knows us. Jesus says over in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, now listen closely to this, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. I always say on Wednesday night, profession does not mean possession. Just because we say we're a Christ follower, or a Christian is the word we like to use, just because we say we're a Christian, doesn't mean we're a Christ follower. Our life should reflect what we say. Amen? Amen. Our life should reflect what we say. Amen. 
The ones that try to present themselves holy in front of people may find themselves unholy in the sight of the Lord. Matthew 7, 21 says this, and this is a scary verse to think about. It's a serious verse we need to think about. It says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father that is in heaven. See what I was saying earlier? We have to live within the will of Jesus Christ. Uh, these people that Jesus is talking to in this verse, they go on to say, well, well, we did this and we performed miracles and we did this and we did that. And Jesus at the end of this passage says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. See, it's about Jesus knowing us. That doesn't, I know he knows every one of us. He created every one of us. But does he know you personally? Are you in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you humbled yourself to get on your knees and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you humbled yourself enough to say, I know I'm a sinner. I cannot do life by myself. I need a Lord and I need a Savior. I need somebody to forgive me. And the only person that can do that is Jesus Christ because He died on the cross for us. Amen. Only He and, and Him alone can bring about that salvation in your life. That's what a personal relationship is. It looks like with Jesus Christ. I want to read another passage to you. Matthew 19. This is a story about a fellow who was pretty much doing everything right in his life, but there was one area in his life that was separating him from Jesus. Now, this one area we're going to talk about here uh, represents anything in your life that separates you from Jesus Christ. Listen to this. This is Matthew 19, 16 through 23. Just then a man came up to Jesus, Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why should you ask me about what is good? Jesus, Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered. Now listen closely to this, folks. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to go to heaven. Now, I get asked this question a lot about this passage. Did Jesus really mean for that rich man to sell all of his stuff and give it to the poor? Yeah, he did. That particular man there, he did. That doesn't mean he asked every rich person to sell what they got and give to the poor. The reason he asked that man to do it is because that's what separated him from Jesus Christ, is his wealth. He put all his dependence in his bank account. He could not let go of that wealth because that was his security blanket. Like I said, you have to surrender every area of your life to Jesus Christ, even your wealth. Your bank account must be surrendered to Jesus Christ. No, that doesn't mean every one of you need to go sell everything you got and give to the poor. But if Jesus is speaking to you that way, go do it. Go do it. What you're going to find out is the richest man that ever died died with very little material possession because he had given everything he made to the poor and he had stored up treasures in heaven. See, when you do stuff like that, you're just storing up treasures in heaven. Those treasures in heaven mean a lot more than material possessions Amen. to on earth. Amen. The fourth <clears throat> point I want to talk about 
No, I'll, let's go back. I want to talk about one more before this, the third one. There will be an announcement. There will be an announcement. Over 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, the trumpet call of God. There will be a trumpet call. There will be the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God. This will happen so loud that we cannot help but hear it. There will be an announcement, a loud command, the voice of an archangel. Now, the only archangel that's taught where that is ever mentioned in the Bible is who? Michael. Who said that? Movie? I told you you need to preach today. No. <laughs> Michael is the only archangel ever mentioned in the Bible, although there may be many. But Michael will probably be the one with the loud command and the voice of the archangel. The trumpet call of God. Over in Exodus 19, 19, see the trumpet has been used a lot uh, throughout Scripture to bring about an announcement or to bring attention to people. Over in Exodus 19, 19, it says this, As the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Now, they were on Mount Sinai at the time, uh, had just reached Mount Sinai and Moses was about to go up and receive the Ten Commandments and God had given Moses instruction for the Israelites not to come to the mountain, not to touch the mountain. Uh, and when they started hearing this trumpet, it scared them to death and they went and told Moses, please tell God to only speak to you. We cannot talk to him or he'll destroy us. This trumpet kept getting louder and louder and louder. Can you imagine what that must have sounded like? And Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. Although it must not have bothered them too bad, because when he come back down from the mountain, you know what they were doing. Yeah. Acting stupid. Yeah. There will be a loud command. There will be a trumpet call. You cannot miss it. It's going to be so loud, it's going to get the attention of everybody on earth. My prayer is, when Jesus comes back to gather His church, when he, he actually stays in the air, it says we meet the Lord in the air, He sends His angels down. My prayer is there will be nobody left in Emmanuel. Nobody to open the door the following Sunday. That's my prayer. Somebody may stumble across our bank account, but it won't do them no good. There's nobody here to sign checks because they're all, they're all in heaven. You see why you don't put your dependence on money? Money comes and money goes. And when Jesus comes back to get us, money don't matter a thing. Amen. We're not taking it to heaven with us. We don't need it. Amen. Fourth point. The dead in Christ will rise first. Over in Matthew 27, 52, it says the earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. That's another question I get asked. Will the tombs literally bust open and people come out? Yeah, they will. They certainly will, just like they did when Jesus was hanging on the cross, when he died from when he died until he was resurrected. Tombs broke open, it says clearly they broke open and people came out of the tomb. Now, when we get raised from the dead, I mentioned that the dead in Christ are going to rise. Oh, I hadn't brought it up yet, but the dead in Christ will rise first. Um, we will come out with a glorified body. Bob won't need that car no more. Amen. He won't need that car. All of us that are hurting all the time, you won't hurt anymore. Amen. You won't age anymore. You won't feel no pain. You won't feel no sadness. <coughs> you won't feel no hate. Glory. Nothing but joy. Nothing but joy. Not everyone will experience physical death. That's my fifth point. Not everyone will experience physical death. Verse 17. It said, talks about the dead in Christ rising. Then it says, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. Caught up. That word means rapture in Latin. Everybody always says the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's according to what Bible you're using. The Latin version of our Bible does have the word rapture instead of called up. 
Uh, rapture means to be caught up, to be snatched up, in the blinking of an eye. So we who are still alive on that day will not experience physical death. Um, there's been two cases in the Bible so far of men who have not experienced physical death. Listen to this one. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. The first was Elijah. God took him up. He never died in physical death. Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. We have two people here in, out of all creation that have never experienced physical death. Would it be cool if Jesus came right now and all of us are still alive and just get snatched up and without experiencing physical death? Wouldn't that be cool? Even if we're not alive, we still will come out of the tomb. And the dead get first priority. They come out of the tomb first. They join the, the Lord first in the air. And we who are still alive will come second. See, this is why this topic is not ever preached on. Because most of the people don't even understand it. They don't understand that there's two parts to the second coming. The rapture of the church. And seven years later, the revelation when the church comes back to earth with Jesus Christ. And he sets up his kingdom for a thousand years. And then a lot happens after the thousand years. We go into uh, living happily ever after. And I, that's a whole other sermon. Point six. We're about to run out of time. We will all be changed. As soon as we're raptured up, we'll all be changed in the blinking of an eye. First Corinthians 15, 42 through 44. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown it, it is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. We will have a spiritual body, like I said early, earlier, that never faces any of the problems we face today. None of them. And we'll be that way forever and ever and ever. Point seven, and this will wind it up. Jesus commands us to be ready and to keep watch. Matthew 24, 42 through 44 says this. And not only here, all through the Bible, all through the New Testament, over 50 times Jesus warns us to be ready and to keep watch. Listen to these two verses, or a couple verses here. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know what day our Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not left his house, would not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you least expect it. Jesus is going to come back and get us when we least expect it. The blinking of an eye could happen right now. Like I said, if you want to be on fire for the Lord, live each and every day like He's coming to get you that very day. Live today like He's coming this afternoon. My big question to you right now as if you knew he was coming at 5 o'clock this evening to gather up his church, would you change anything you're doing? That's the question of the day. Would you change anything you're doing? There's a couple quotes I want to read you before I close. Um, this first one's by Billy Graham. Listen closely. We're to wait for the coming of Christ with patience. We're to watch with anticipation. We are to work with zeal. We are to pre prepare with urgency. Scripture says Christ is coming when you're least expecting Him. Coming as a thief. He said be prepared, get ready, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? And the other quote is by C.S. Lewis. 
Well, this time it will be God without disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late to choose your side. C.S. Lewis. Chris, you and Janet can come on. I, I challenge you today. Live each and every day as if Jesus is coming back. Let this be on your mind more than it has been. The rapture of the church could happen at any time. The Bible foretold of the first coming that we celebrated yesterday. It foretold in detail how Jesus would be born. And it happened just as the Bible had prophesied. Why not the second coming happen just as it is prophesied? It will happen just as the Bible says it will. And it will happen at any moment. Are you ready? Are you ready? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? It's all about humility. Humble yourself. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And spend eternity with Him. Or the opposite, spend eternity separated from God. That's not pleasant. Not when you get descriptions of what hell is like in Revelation. Not a pleasant place to be for eternity. That's my challenge today to you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming up.